everyone, and welcome to the Screen Chronicles. I'm Steve. With me, as always, is Colby. You may notice we also have a very special guest today. If you're listening to this show, you probably know him as Steapa, the big man, the giant oak who stood guard over the family of Alfred. Today, we have Adrian Boucher Hello. on the show. Hello, everybody. Yeah, thanks for coming on, thanks. Adrian. I really thanks. appreciate well, guys, it. Guys, thanks for having me. Um, I, I know you massive fans of the show, and it comes across, and that's why I'm here. Um, oh, great, great. Get in touch with the fans. Um, they've been very loyal to me. Yeah, there are people out there that, that are interested in little old me doing my little old stuff, and, and believe me, I'm very, very grateful. And I've made some very good friends from all over the world, and your support means a lot to me. So mm. let me say right off the bat, thank you very much for all the comments I've had, and all the support I've had, and I hope you get a question in. I hope I can answer it. So <laughs> totally. So uh, if you're listening, if you've listened to our other shows, we're actually doing something a little bit different today. We had fans submit questions in to both Adrian and, and ourselves. And I mean, we got flooded with questions. There's no doubt that Steapa was loved by the Last Kingdom community. And Steve, in our opinion, uh, Steapa really embodies a lot of what makes the Last Kingdom so great, including some great action, some very funny moments. And just that, that really brotherly heart that Steapa, that Steapa has. Absolutely. And yes, a lot of the questions were regarding um, what happened in season four. But um, definitely... Spoiler the, the alert, lo- everyone. Yeah, for spoiler season alert. Four <laughs> of the season last four, kingdom. we're talking today. Uh, some, um, some of us may not get out of here alive. <laughs> um, uh, just, just, to, just I, I want to take this opportunity as a special shout out to um, a, a very special follower of mine. Um, who I helped, she told me I helped her at a, at a difficult time. And it's, it's, it's through my association with Final Fantasy. And it's this brilliant um, Australian artist, um, Crimson Sun. I don't know whether you know her work. If, if nobody's ever heard of her, please check her out on, on Instagram and, and, and Facebook. Area. She's the most brilliant artist, but she also does other stuff. And I actually have one of her, just an, an amazing portrait on my wall there. And she also did the Stay Apple at Rest cartoon uh, just last week and released it, which, which got a, an amazing amount of support. So thank you, Krim. I, you mean a lot to me. Um, and, so does, and so do all the other people. You know, Joanna in Germany, who's a nurse, um, who sort of tutored me in Instagram. <laughs> when I first started, I, I was just putting pictures out there. And she says, no, Adrian, you've, you've got to put the hashtag on as well. Um, <laughs> because otherwise, no one's, gonna, no one's even going to know who you are. So thank you, Joanne. Thank you to Rihanna and all the, the people that follow me on my, on my uh, fan site, um, Steapa Sisters and Adrian Any Day. And yeah. thank you, everybody. Your, your correspondence over the last week or so has been amazing. And, and thank you very, very much. I mean it from the bottom of my heart. Well, speaking of the Steapa sisters, uh, one of our first fan <laughs> questions we have for you is from Catherine Hart. Um, the Steapa sisters are wondering what uh, life has been like uh, for you whilst in lockdown. To be honest with you, and I shouldn't really be saying this, I've been loving it. Um, okay. I've been in the very fortunate position of, of having quite a lot of work over the last few years. And I realized how lucky I've been in that situation because it's not always like that in acting. Even when you're working, there are massive imperatives to do a self-tape. A whole load of a scene comes in and it needs to be done the following day. And you know, the issue is not learning the lines or, or filming. It's finding someone to read with you. And so it's just like an immense amount of pressure. Well, I find it very stressful to, okay. to get these things done. Obviously, over the last two months, the industry has just stopped. Just to have that, the pressure of that potential thing lifted and know that nothing's coming in, nothing's going to come in. So just chill out, you know, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and sit back. And for me, I mean, the weather's been lovely. So I've been sitting in the garden and I, you know, I just, I just watch a lot of YouTube tutorials. I, I recently become quite interested in photography. So oh. I'm trying to learn more, more about that. And, but I'm also interested in historical European martial arts and, and, and weapons and, and, and also all, of, all the astrophysics and chemistry stuff, which I've, which I've always loved throughout my life. And it's just such a great time now where there, there are all these uh, 
doctors and professors of, of mathematics and physics and astronomy coming on and just giving you a 10, 15, 20 minute lecture of, about subjects which you might have found a little bit difficult reading it, a little bit dry in textbook. And it's totally. there and you just, it's just, it's, it, it's just a treat, you know? And to be able to just sit back and, I know I'm sounding really boring talking about astrophysics, but, <laughs> but, it's, but it's- Understanding it's, the universe, well, you know? It's, well, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's fun to learn about that. It's, it's better when it's digestible, um, yeah, yeah, for I mean, sure. And, and, you know, I owe Carl Sagan a great, you know, debt of gratitude for, for not, not starting my interest, because my interest was already there, but it was uh, his, his groundbreaking Cosmos program. And, and all yeah. the people who followed him, Brian Cox, and, uh, you know, following in the footsteps. And, yeah, now it's a great time, because it's, there's the, um, what's that, that's a sitcom, American sitcom, the, the, uh, with all the geeks in it. Um, Big Bang Theory. Big Bang, Big Bang Theory. Theory. When I when I watched that, I thought, oh my god, <laughs> it's my inner Sheldon. Is, oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm afraid I'm a little bit of an inner Sheldon. Um, I, I thought this is the time is now. You know, I, I love this stuff, and Take it's no longer. It. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's no longer uh, to be to be a dark secret hidden away. Yes, I like astrophysics. Okay. Awesome. So you have all these other interests, um, and we want to know. <clears throat> Kirsty wants to know how did you get into acting. <laughs> by default um yeah, i think that happens with a lot of actors uh i i've, I've told the story before but it was at, at, at sort of primary school when we were we were singing a song for a sort of classroom play kind of thing and it was a, a song called the gas man or the gas man came to call and it was a, about a gas man and he came to fix something and he as a result of fixing that one thing he something else up and and the carpenter had to come and fix what he'd messed up so the carpenter came and fixed fixed that and then he cocked something up and then the, the electrician had to come and fix something up um so he went around basically on the monday morning the gas man came to call and he hammered any chisel and he said look what i've found your drafts are full of something and your something else is coming and, and anyway somebody else had to come <laughs> and fix it so all the, you get around to sunday again so it was on the monday morning that the gas man came to call and well, I was singing this, and as you can probably tell, my voice is awful. And the singing teacher recognized that as well instantly and said, oh, come on. You're, not, you're not singing in there. You're not singing with us. <laughs> um, so she, she plucked me out of there and said, get in the gas man outfit. And I was the gas man. I was put in a boiler suit and I had a big spanner, and, and I, that's where it was. Um, and from then on, I, I did... Um, you know, nativity plays and whatever. And I, I went on and wrote an end of year review. But when I left school, I, I just, I didn't have the courage of my convictions. I, I thought I can't go from uh, sixth form to drama school. I, I just didn't, I didn't think I'd be good enough. I didn't think I'd get in. Uh, you know, someone that's doing physics, chemistry, maths is not going to be the first choice for someone going to drama school. So I, I, I went and pursued a career in, in something else. I was a, I was a civil engineer. Oh. And, and I did that for a few years. Yeah. Until I just, a friend of mine died, actually. A, fr a friend of mine, uh, a great friend of mine who's a lawyer, and he, he went off to Australia. He thought he'd made it. He, he got a great girl, went to Australia, and they were going to have a great life. And within a year, he was dead. He died from nocturnal mm. epilepsy. And um, we, we didn't know about it until, you know, sort of a couple of months later or something. Um, you know, the news eventually filtered back. And, 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 and I, and I think some of my other friends just thought, you know what, you only live once. That's and another friend just quit his job and, and went to live in the Virgin Islands. And, uh, and I thought, yeah, I can't, uh, I can't do this civil engineering thing anymore. I, I remember the day distinctly. I was, I'd been doing it for a few years and it was the winter time and I'd come off this one contract building a road. And I thought I was going to come inside for the, for the winter into the office and do just some guest work. So I, I turned up at the office and I had a you know a pinstripe suit on and tie and just a just a white just a cotton shirt and a suit. And maybe I wasn't paying attention, but they said, "No, no, Adrian, you're going out and doing the principal inspection today." Well, what's that? And it was basically me on an on an articulated platform, looking and I kid you not, looking at every square inch of a bridge, and I mean every square inch, top, bottom, sides, road every square inch at the cracks in the concrete of this bridge. And I had nothing. I had a white cotton shirt and it was minus 10. And I, 
<laughs> and there was a, there was a, there was the guy there was the guy on the articulated hoist who who operated the thing, and I was it was me going. And yeah, you know, he obviously took pity on me, and he gave me he, he gave me half of his coffee because because I had nothing because I thought I was going to be in the office all day, and I was there, and I just thought, no, I can't, <laughs> I, can't, I can't do this anymore, and so I quit my job. I quit the job and I, I went to work for an agency. I, I remember the day, it was, a, it was a seminal day in my life. There are, there are a couple of seminal days in my life. And, and one was when I was at school and I thought, shall I go and play rugby as an option? Because um, obviously you play rugby compulsorily, but shall I, shall I try out for the team? And I, I made that decision to go and play rugby. And it was, it was like one of the, I can, I can tell you now, one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life. The, the camaraderie, the, the ethos, the, you know, the hard nature of the game, the, the way everybody has to look after each other. It, it, it's brought me so much fun. Obviously, I've never played, I haven't played rugby for years, but those years of playing rugby were some of the best years of my life. And it was just on that decision to, to, to play that. And it was, it was a, you know, shall I, shall I? Because it's a bit of a rough game. I don't know. Um, anyway, I, I chose that. And then the other, the other seminal day was when I was on my way to this temping job. And I walked down the street and I, I passed somebody that I used to work with as, as the, uh, in the in engineering capacity. And just before I passed him, I saw an advertisement on the side of the wall for uh, the drama school. And I, I looked at that and I said, that's it. And just as I looked at that, that image, that poster on the wall and that person, I thought, that's my old life and that's my new life. Wow. God, I'm totally welling up now. <laughs> it's like a funny moment. <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, it was just like that. Um, I'll tell God. you what, you're, Sorry. you're, no, your friend would be, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that you sadly lost would be, would be proud to know that his friends pursued what they wanted to do inspired by his life. So that's pretty cool. Uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I, I went to, uh, went to drama school, I did that and, you know, obviously struggled for, for a long time as, as we all do and, and did, you know, a whole host of, of jobs and, you know, lived a very Spartan life. You know, I was, I was heavily in debt. Uh, I, you know, because there was, you know, this was, we're going back to the previous recession. Now, not, we're not, I'm not talking the recession we had 10 years ago. I'm talking to the one 10 years before that. Gotcha. And I had, I had no work and I, I, I ran up a credit card bill. And, you know, I was a professional man. I was a civil engineer. I had, I could have, I could have worked, but I said, I'm not going back to that. I, I'm not going to, I'm going to stick with this. And I ended up with oh, God, about 20,000 pounds worth of debt on my credit cards. But I said, no, I'm not giving it. I'm not, I'm not jacking this in because if I go and do a job now, the call comes and I, I can't come because I'm doing this job. So I, I, I wrecked it and I just said, you've got to have faith in yourself. And, and I did. And uh, the call came. It was an advertisement for a job and, and, I, uh, and, I, and I went for it and I thought, I'm just right. I am absolutely right for this job. And it was with a very prestigious director and in a, in a very prestigious play touring around I, I i came down to london on the train and i i was so hyped up for this thing and i i just there was a sort of reception area where they were you know taking names before you go in and, and, and see the director and i was so hyped up i just i had tunnel vision and i just i just walked straight in i not because i was that's an arrogant thing i just thought that's where it is i was told to come to this room i didn't realize there was a little reception and i just walked straight in and there was somebody auditioning and 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 with the director there and i went oh Oh God, I'm sorry. He said, "No, just, just, just give us a minute." <laughs> and, I, and I and I waited outside. And uh, to cut a long story short, that, that guy that I um, walked in on, we both got the job. And we he talked about that moment later. But I I was having this uh, interview. It wasn't an audition. It was an interview. When you get to a certain sort of level as a writer, producer, director, you can tell whether someone's going to be right for the part. I guess. You don't have, they don't have to read for it, you know. You can tell if they've got the right sort of ethos, the right demeanor, mm. the right physicality or everything. And, you know, with all, with all your attributes as a writer, producer, director, you can craft something with, with somebody that you have some confidence in. And we chatted for a while. And I said, you, you inspired me 
to become an actor. And I, I, it was so nice to be able to tell the truth to somebody. I can't stand bullshit and backstabbing and double dealing and sucking up. I can't stand it. So when you get an opportunity to actually be truthful, I, I, I take it. And I, and I saw this, this, this project, producer, director, writer, and I said, your play convinced me to be an actor. Your, your play won a, won a Lawrence Olivier Award many years ago, and it toured to my little town. We didn't even have a theater at that point. It was done on stage blocks in, in a sort of um, dance hall, I suppose. And I went there with my friend, and I was, I was blown away by this thing. And it was a very successful <coughs> award-winning play. And to be able to tell that guy that story, and, and just, just to have a, a true, honest conversation, say, your play brought me to where I am now. And he said, do you think you can do this? And I said, yeah, I do think I can do it. He said, yeah, I think you can do it too. Cool. And um, cool. anyway, he had me. He had me. And I, and I did this play and I toured. And then I got another thing and another thing. And the 20 grand gone. Nice. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so how did you become uh, involved with The Last Kingdom? <laughs> that is, um, this, this, oh my God, this is so, <laughs> this is so weird. Uh, it, it's a continuation of that very story. Yeah. It's a continuation of that very story. I, I, I taught in this play with this guy and I, and I loved him. We got on really well. He was a rugby player as well. Um, and it, and it was a very successful show and it, and, and it played everywhere and it was great. And then I, I went off and did other stuff. And then many years later, whatever it was, 10, 15 years later, I saw that Carnival had bought the rights to the Bernard Cornwall books. I didn't know who Carnival were. I said, Carnival. I looked at it. Oh, Downton Abbey. I'd never seen Downton, but I know it's very, very successful. Carnival had bought up the rights to do The Last Kingdom. And I knew Bernard Cornwall because obviously I knew the Sharp, sharp novels and, and, and the Sharp TV series, which I grew up and I absolutely loved. And I thought, so they're doing this. Oh man, I've got to get on this. I've got to get on this. So I just kept that in the back of my mind. And some, some, some months later, perhaps it was a year later, I don't know. Um, it, it appears there was a, an open casting call for characters for this, for this thing. I went, this is it, this is it, they're casting. Oh God. I wanted to make myself available for this, for this casting. So I wanted, to, I wanted to clear my sort of diary. And unfortunately, just at that moment, this director that I'd worked with 10, 15 years earlier approached me directly and said, Adrian, I'm doing this show again. I'm tweaking it slightly. It's going to be slightly different. We're going on the road. It's actually big money because it's not a small thing anymore. It's a big deal. It's a lot of money. It's for three or four months. I want you. I want you to go and reprise that role. It's yours. And I thought, but I want to keep myself open for the possibility of a casting with the last kingdom. If I'm mm. in, if I'm in Northumbria, you know, six nights a week doing that, there's no way I'm going to be able to get down there to do a, a you know, a casting. Or if I get the job, there's no way I'm going to be available. So I just thought, it's, it's always like this in this industry. You get you get nothing, and then you get everything. And and right. so I, I, I had to say to this guy, "I'm sorry, I, I can't do it." Um, not because I have anything, but because I might have something. I might get an audition. Yeah. Wow. Did you have like a gut and feeling about it or something about? I that, didn't. The last I didn't. I I didn't have a gut feeling at all. No. But I said. I can do this show again for, for three or four months. I've done it before and it's been very successful. And I know it'll be very successful again. Or I can just hold out and, and, and see if anything happens. And I held out and I got a casting. And so it paid off. It was just, yeah. you know, it could have gone, it could have gone either way, you know, it ah. could have gone either way. Doing a self tape with my friend who always used to help me out with the self tapes. And, you know, I used to impose him because he was really good at leading. I used to impose myself on him all the time and say, Adrian, his name was also Adrian. Adrian, can you, can you help me out tonight? And he said, oh, I can give you an hour and I would drive over there and we'd, we'd do our, and, and, and I think I did maybe two that week. 
and I thought oh, I can't impose on you anymore. I just hope it's not. I hope it's a long time before I get another self tape to have to do because, you know, although I want the work, I just don't want to impose him because he's such a nice guy. And the very next day, I got a I got a self tape to do, and I said, "Oh, mate, can I come back?" <laughs> <laughs> and and he said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can give you an hour." And and so I went back there and um and and I read it. Actually, sorry, I'm, I'm now I've, I've gone ahead of myself because I'm now talking about the, sec- the season two. I auditioned for season one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm now talking about season two, and I auditioned for season one, and they brought me in, and that's how I know that it was an open casting because I saw the breakdown for uh, for Uhtred and for you know, all the main characters for Abur and, and everybody else, and th- and they brought me in and they wanted me to read for a character. And I, I, and I thought, I've got to be in with a shout here. This character was like, he was like a massively experienced battlefield warrior, invincible, muscular, you know, a real man's man, doesn't take any shit, uh, calls it like it is. Um, but they, you know, they really emphasize the physicality. And, and I thought, well, I'm six foot four, I'm 17 stone. I'm very proficient in, in um, you know, sword fighting and, and, and medieval stuff like that. I've got to be in there with a shout. And I and I went there, and I remember I I remember because Joseph was talking about it the other day. It was Nick Murphy who was the director, and I I didn't really know him. And he gave me the scene, and he said, "Now this is a park bench scene. I don't know whether you're familiar with a park bench scene. Is where you get just two characters sitting on a park bench, and they often shoot it, you know, here and the other guy's there. So it's like a two shots, waking okay. two shots, and and yeah." So what do you think about life? Yeah, it sucks, doesn't it? And the other guy goes, yeah, whatever. It's it's a park bench scene, you know? Because yeah, you're just right. looking out in, you're looking out into the distance and you're just talking, you know, whatever. And he said, This is a park bench scene, but it's not I don't want to do this as a park bench scene. It's got to be more natural than that. So I, I I read this and I just I had no idea what he was talking about. It was a park bench scene. Right. <laughs> and you came in for this warrior. Type yeah, guy. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, you know, it was it was a it was a warrior guy, but he was having a park bench scene moment, mm. right? Okay. And anyway, I to cut a long story short, I didn't get it, and I was very interested to see who got it. And I, when I so when the show aired, I absolutely loved it. I mean, I fell yeah. in love with the, with the Last Kingdom from day one. So good. And, and I and I watched the first episode, and then I waited for the next week for the second episode, and it was like because it goes so fast and they put so much stuff in there, you're, you're left kind of traumatized at the end. You want more. So I, I just thought, no, I can't do this. I, I, need, I need more. So I, I, I saved up and I, I let them all accumulate and, and watched them, binge them on, on iPlayer at the end because I, I found it easier that way. Yeah. And, and I, I just thought, okay, I've got to watch this park bench scene. And there it is. It's in the thing and it's a fucking park bench scene. <laughs> <laughs> oh. and, <laughs> um, anyway. So that so I I didn't get it, but I absolutely loved the show. I fell in love. Wait, which it. character was was it you were auditioning for the first time? Um, well, I I was I was gonna not tell you this. But, okay. Um, no 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 I, I no no I was gonna not tell you this, but I uh, um I, I will tell you because it's uh, it was uh, Leia Fridge. Okay. And I I saw Adrian Bowers' portrayal of Leia Fridge. And I thought, oh, Jesus, thank God I didn't get that because he absolutely aced that. I mean, he was. He did. He did he great. Abs- I mean, yeah. yeah, he was. He absolutely aced it. And I thought, no, mate, hats off to you. I couldn't have done that. You've made that your own. And um, but the interesting thing is, Adrian Bowers. I, I met him a couple of times in Budapest um, in season three, um, and he's a lovely guy, really, really nice guy. And but Adrian Bauer is not. He's my height. He's six four, um, but he is not a massive. He's not a massive guy. He's right. very slim. Guy. He's a very slim guy. Very narrow shouldered. And I feel, you know, how the hell did you convince them that you were this massive beast of a warrior, um, Leofrich? Because what they did was Leofrich was a sort of accumulation of a couple of characters, possibly even Stayapa in the in season one. Right. That's and, what I've heard. So, so I thought, how do they convince, how did you, you know, because your, your shoulders are like this and you're very slim. Um, 
but he got it. And he, I said, he absolutely aced it. And, and I thought, hats off to you, mate. You've made that your own. And I thought, I wonder, I wonder if you were sort of a left field choice. Um, because, you know, you would have had other guys there, myself included, and other really big guys right. who, who were there. Um, and, and maybe he just aced the audition. And they thought, okay, well, we can, we can build him up. And sure enough, I, I, when, I, when I was there and I met him and I was in the makeup place with him and, and, and everything, yeah, he's got massive shoulder pads on and there is armor. And, mm. and, and, he, and, he's, and he, wears his, oh, okay. he wears his, he wears his mail. Um, he wears the van braces, the leather kind of gauntlet things on your, on your wrists. Mm -hmm. He wears those over his mail just to bulk him up. And I thought, okay, they, they bulked him up. And so I was thinking, well, were you perhaps a left field choice for that? Or, were you, or was your name on that all the time? And the reason I thought that was because when I got to do an, an audition for the second season, they obviously remembered me or maybe my agent reapplied again. Anyway, I got seen again and I came in and I was sitting in the um, sort of the waiting area for, for, for Spotlight where they were doing it. And there were these like huge, huge, great, like, you probably don't remember this guy, but it was a, it was a character called like Giant Haystacks, who's a, who was a British wrestler. Just big, big bellied, long kind of black and gray hair, massive shaggy beard. You know that guy at the beginning of um, Gladiator, who that is in the German forest and, and, the, and, the, and, and the, uh, the Romans are there and they're saying, do you think they're going to give in? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah, yeah. barbarian guy, right? Yeah, 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 and he just he holds up there and he goes, what are you <laughs> that's, what, that's what the other guys were there. And I, and I thought, bloody hell, guys, what, what roles are you auditioning for today? Can't be the same as me. And then I later realized, I thought, well, maybe they were. Maybe that was their original Stayapa. That was their original concept of Stayapa because he's kind of like that in the books. He's a big brute of a man you know, not endowed with a great deal of, of, of well, he's, they, they say his brain is a, a turnip, basically. Mm. Um, and, and I thought maybe, maybe I'm the left field choice. Uh, and maybe I wasn't, you know, the top of their list of, of ideal candidates. Anyway, season two rolls around and they call me in again. Uh, got sent the, the sides for, for Stay Upper. And th th there weren't many, obviously, because it's the upper. <laughs> and uh, um, uh, I'd, I'd learnt these, and they called me in. And just before, just a couple of days earlier, my agent sent me another couple of uh, scenes to do, or another scene, just to add to the to the original one. And and then, so I, so I'm confident. I'm thinking, okay, I'm set. You know, I, I I was good the first time. They didn't want me. I'm set. The f I'm, I'm exactly what they want in terms of physicality. I've got all the requisite skills know the lines i felt good so i'm going in on the tube and i'm 10 minutes out i'm just looking on my phone and my agent's emailed me again agent did you get the sides and i, and I went yeah yeah i got the sides did you get the additional sides what <laughs> <laughs> i sent you additional sides I, and, and i thought he meant the sides from last night and <laughs> <laughs> And he'd sent another three pages of stuff. I'm going, it's <laughs> 10 minutes. I, what, I've got three pages of stuff to them up 10 minutes away. Oh, boy. And I just thought, oh, my God. And the, and the blood drains from your face because you're all set up. You think I'm in a good place. And then <laughs> but you just go, mm, I'm going to... And somehow something takes over and anyway, I'm, you know, I'm learning them as I'm walking to the thing and, and I get there and I, and I just thought, shall I just, shall I just fall on their mercy and say, listen, I'm sorry, I, I, I messed up. I haven't got the sides. I didn't have time to learn. I can't say that. I'm going to look like an absolute idiot. I've just got to do the best I can. So the casting director, uh, Kelly says, okay, thanks, Adrian. Th thanks for coming. Right. Let's, let's start, let's start them. Uh, which scene do you want to start with? Start with the end one. <laughs> of course. Yep. Great. Uh, and, Great. I, and I just went blank. I just, I just, I thought it's that moment of panic when you, everything just goes. I just took a breath and I said, can you just give me the first line again? And then she gave me the first line and I was off. I was off. And then I was fine. And, and then, and then, you know, that, that sort of part of the, of the interview finishes. 
and and then the producer is there he says oh i really liked your 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 fighting reel and, and i said wow thank you because i mean i had i had a lot of this stuff i had a lot of fighting stuff because you right. know, I've done a lot of fighting stuff and he said i really liked your reel i said oh, you know i really love your show and it was just a sort of a, a bromance because <laughs> I, I genuinely loved the show i mean i absolutely loved it yeah we just talked about it and just just you know shot the breeze as they say <laughs> and um it was good and but yeah then i got it well we think we think you were the right choice we yeah. definitely think you were the right choice now a couple people were asking um michelle george and caitlin from reddit both want to know if you were familiar with the books before you came onto the show uh no okay. um i i used to read a lot i always used to pass on on the bookcases in the in the stores the bernard cornwall books i'd see all the sharp novels there because I don't know whether you're familiar with Sharp. You know, he, he wrote all of those. Um, and then they, they would have all the Sharp novels there. And then they would have the um, sort of a lot the I'm not sure what they're called, actually. They were originally called something else, not The Last Kingdom, the, the Uhtred novels or something. something the like Saxon that. Tales, I think, right? Sa that, thank, thank, thank you, Steve. The Saxon Tales. <laughs> and I would, and I thought, oh, God, can I? And I didn't really know anything about the Dark Ages. And I, and I thought, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to leave that. I'm going to leave that for a moment. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go there. So no, I didn't read the books. Obviously, saw the saw the first season, and okay. Stair wasn't in the first season. And they explained this to me. They said he's in the books, but he was he wasn't in the first season. Leofrich was sort of an amalgam of a, I think a character called Leofrich and a sort of Stair character. We had so heard that. Yeah. That. Um, so they said this is a new Stair really, and I wanted to get up to speed because, as you probably know, each each season of the last kingdom deals with two books in the series and i thought I, i'd like to know what goes on especially if i've you know signed a contract to be in one season i'd like to know what happens by the end of the season because the, the scripts are not aren't always complete by the time you you start the show you, know, you probably only get four scripts uh, and they haven't been written or they have they haven't given them to you maybe they have been written but they're not in a, an advanced state of, of gotcha where they're giving where they're giving out so yeah, I, I, I thought, well, I, I don't have time to read all these books. So I started getting those audio books that you listen to. Yeah, yeah. I, to be honest with you, I struggled. I, I really struggled with those um, because it's, it's, uh, they were read, they were narrated by this very deep sounding old guy. He must have been 60 or 70 because he's narrating his life as, as someone who survived all these encounters as, a, as an old Uhtred. Oh, and this okay. time, Alex had, had done the job of the first season and i couldn't see anybody else oh, in interesting. That role. and i couldn't i couldn't unhear alex's accent and i and i found them a bit slow to be honest with you there as well so i so i gave up and and started reading them i thought damn it i'm gonna have to read these things so i did and i loved them there's if, if you if you want a good read uh, just a, a rollicking adventure they're so easy to read i don't mean that in a in a um, disparaging way, but they're, they're, they're a page turner, you know? Yeah, page turner, absolutely. <laughs> and yes, so, uh, read them. They're, they're great fun. Um, cool. I, it's not going to be much of a guide for the Last Kingdom TV series now because they've, they've gone off them to a greater rather than lesser extent, I think. But if you just want a, a good adventure story, then yeah, certainly I've, I, I read the first, so I read the first eight that okay. might have applied to me. Yeah. Oh, cool. okay, cool. And, and we heard you also uh, watched a couple of our other videos and you had something to say to, to Joseph Milson. Oh, about yeah, yeah, about... yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I, saw, I saw Joseph and I, yeah, in fact, I have two things to say, Joseph, actually. I've just remembered. He was alluding to the fact that he was playing Henry V. I think he might have done it on, at the National. I'm not sure where he did it. Anyway, he was doing Henry V and he seemed to think that uh, Henry V got hit in the face uh, with an arrow, and I, I just want to confirm this for you, Joseph. Uh, yes, he did. Okay. Um, he wasn't Henry V at the time, he was uh, Henry IV's son, and he got hit uh, at the Battle of Shrewsbury, 1403, arrow into, I think, the left left part of his face, and it went into his skull, and his life was sort of hanging by a thread, and it, it's a very gruesome story where, you know, the royal surgeon had to get the sort of the royal blacksmith or the royal um, manufacturer of surgical instruments to uh, craft a, a sort of tubular instrument that they forced up into his cheek and had a retractable kind of claw thing that went up inside this tube, grasped the, the arrowhead 
and then dragged it back down here. So you can imagine the pain this poor guy must have. Yeah, <laughs> and the scar, presumably. Um, but yes, that, that is what happens. But when I saw, when I saw Joseph on, uh, he was telling you what, what he'd been doing. And he said he was, uh, he was in um, uh, Angel Has Fallen. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I've seen that movie now. And I, and I saw the part. And I, I auditioned for that role. Oh, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> I auditioned for his role, where, um, except I think I got a bit of a bum steer from my agent at the time because he was playing it as an American. And, and I, was playing, I was told to go in and play it as a Frenchman. And I go, oh. fuck you, throw me down the fucking stairs, you stupid asshole. <laughs> um, and, and, and someone says, knock it off, Gaspar. Um, we're all on one team together or something. And um, yeah, I, 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 except I was a Frenchman and he was uh, something else. Anyway, he got the role. Um, I suspected I probably wouldn't get that role because when my agent got me the part and he said, this is the new Gerard Butler movie. Right. I, I, and I've been told this by my by a former girlfriend that I, I look like Gerard Butler. Um, I can see it. I can see it. Yeah. Yeah, when I had, when I had, the, when I had the, the, the haircut and everything. Um, I can see it. She used to jokingly refer to me as Gerard GBBD, Gerard Butler's body double. Thank you very much, honey. <laughs> um, and in the scene is this, this character comes in, Gaspar, and he kidnaps Gerard Butler's wife. And I'm thinking, how is that going to look when Gerard Butler looks at these tapes and he sees the guy coming in looking like himself kidnapping his <laughs> wife? There's no way I'm going to get this role. Um, <laughs> and, and I surely didn't. Uh, but actually I've got to tell you a funny story part of the reason why my girlfriend called me Gerard Butler's body devil is because us actors have to do other jobs you know when we're not acting or, or, or I have done until fairly recently and one of these jobs because I work out and I've you know, got a reasonable body I used, to, I used to work for a, a group called the Dream Boys which are like the Chippendales or they used to be years okay. ago and I had a guy there that, that used to run this troupe and he but he also did sort of promotional stuff and he said adrian i've got this job we are we are pretending to be spartan soldiers for the premiere of this movie and what we've got to do is we've got to go out to leicester square where they're doing this movie premiere and we've got to dress up in a little loincloth with a cloak a helmet a shield and a, and a, and a spear thing and for the red carpet premiere of this movie called 300 and I knew nothing about it. And it was in the middle of February and, and we just had to stand there on the carpet with this almost nothing on. And, uh, you know, we, we rocked up at the, at, the, at the cinema just beforehand and we were getting painted up and everything. And I was given, uh, you know, costume props and everything. And I was handed this shield and I was handed this helmet. And these were the actual shields and helmets from the movie 300, which I hadn't seen because oh. this was obviously the premiere. I looked inside, Gerard Butler. <laughs> Ooh. Uh, I went, right. I, I, to be honest with you, I hadn't even heard of Gerard Butler at that point. I, I didn't oh. know his work. But, but, I, but I do now, and I, lo I love him. I think he's great. I think he's managed to transition from sort of a bit cheesy to, to sort of funny action here. I, I love him. But yeah, so I was standing wearing Gerard Butler's cloak, his helmet, and his shield at the premiere. And premiere, I'm standing like you guys. Premiere. <laughs> and, um, and I was and on the red carpet, Gerard was being introduced and, and interviewed, and I was standing there with this Greek mask, thinking, why, why isn't that me? Why am, I, why am I not standing there? And I said to myself, this is the last time this happens. I'm not going to do any more of these premieres standing next to this. I'm going to be on the red carpet next time. And lo and behold, a, a year or so goes by, and I ended up in a role in a movie called Clash of the Titans. Yeah. It was only a tiny little role, um, just playing a soldier again. And I thought to myself, I wonder if they're going to do a Leicester Square premiere. And if they do, whether my mate is going to be in charge of getting people in again, because it's kind of a Greek thing and it's, you know, dressing up the same thing. So sure enough, a year or so goes by. Adrian, are you up for a Leicester Square red carpet premiere dressed up as a Greek soldier? And I went, uh, what's the movie? And they say it's Clash of the Titans. And I had my ticket to attend the premiere as a member of the cast. Yeah. So I thought, shall I go? Shall I go as a member of the cast and put the you know the jacket and everything on, or shall I? Shall I earn some money standing on standing on the carpet as a Greek thing? And I thought, 
I'm going to do both. So I, 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 I put the Greek outfit on and I stood there. Louis Leterrier comes up the stairs with all the, you know, Sam, Sam um, Worthington and everybody else. And he actually, uh, Louis Leterrier spoke to me as a, as a soldier on the way up to the red carpet. And then I quickly, they all went inside. I quickly went around the corner, took all this stuff off, put my jacket, tux and everything on, and went and watched the premiere. Nice. How it's getting paid like Snoop. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> That's onward. Um, um, the Last Kingdom actor's cool. Instagram page wants to know do you, if you remember your first day on set of The Last Kingdom. Oh, my God. Yes, 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 yes. Um, yeah. I, I, yeah, I do very, very well. Um, my first day was actually with Ragnar, with Tobias. Okay. And it, normally what happens in, in The Last Kingdom, they, they have a, a sort of a soundstage in town, which is a big old factory or big, big building in town where they have Alfred's throne room and a few other mm-hmm. sort of ante rooms. And then they have the massive kind of back lot village uh, Winchester and all the other towns and everything out in the country somewhere. And all the throne room scenes normally get filmed, all the early throne room film, throne room scenes get filmed in that first week of production. And then they move out. And because this building is often left dormant, dead, dark for a year, 18 months, the very polished tiled floor just accumulates all the sand and grit and dust that Uh falls from the ceiling. And my very first scene was to walk right from the far entrance through the big double doors, walk straight up to the the throne room where David David Dawson is. It's just David sitting there, I think, and and me. And I'm to announce that uh, Lord the Prisoner or something because we've got Tobias captured right. and Ragnar captured. And of course, it was my first day. And, you know, um, it's like, talking about a massive entrance. It's like walk the whole length of the, of the throne room, just me, and say, Lord, the, the, the prisoner. Right. And this floor, is, it's, it is literally a skating rink. It's, it's yeah. like slippery at the best of times, but with all this dust and accumulation, of, of, it's, just, it, it's literally like a skating rink. <laughs> so I... I walk up and I'm going, oh, what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> and I get up there and what I have to do is I walk up and then sort of do a half turn and, and, and go side on to the king. Lord! And I'm on my ass. I've slipped <laughs> over and I, I am on my ass. And, oh, God. Oh, okay, reset. Go again. <laughs> Lord the Prince. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'll get it, I'll get it. And it wasn't my fault. I mean, it was just genuinely. Just by this time, yeah, by this time, they're putting um, gaffer tape on my shoes. And, and oh. you know, someone, <laughs> someone, by, some, someone by this time thought, I know, why don't we sweep the floor? So they start sweeping the floor and they put gaffer tape, gaffer tape on my shoes and, and I had these kind of Ugg boots on and of course the floor is now really shiny, there's nothing on there and I can hear, so I come off again for the third take. <laughs> Lord the prisoner. <laughs> I think they and, should have taken another approach and just had you come in and just do a slide across the floor and well, stop young, right in front. And be like, well, well, young man, I'm just going to tell you something here. Um, as I said, they do the throne rooms in the beginning of the, the season. When we get to season, season three, my second season, we're doing the throne room scenes and it's the, it's the scene where Uchard is there um, and he slaps the monk and, oh, and yeah. kills him. <laughs> he slaps the monk and he's, and he's dead. And... Um, I go down to him and I go, yeah, Lord, he's, Lord, he's dead. And he says, seize him. And Uhtred pings it out. And I, and I go after him. Of course, the floor is slippery as hell because it's been dormant for six months, uh, 18 months with sand and dust and everything else. And, for fly, and I squash, I squash poor John. I land on top of him. Oh. And, you know, I'm 17 stone. And, 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 and he's been squashed by Stafford. 
<laughs> and then I'm just going to bring you right up to date. Third season, a uh, fourth season, sorry, my third season. We're back in the throne room again. And I have to do this. I have to do this very urgent run in. And this time it's, it's not an empty, empty throne room. It is, it is full of, I don't know how many extras they got in there, soldiers and everything. Maybe 200 people. I, I don't know how many they had, but it was full. It's full yeah. of people. And uh, this, this wasn't on the take. This was on the rehearsal. But I had to run around the corner and, and, and come into that door. And I knew it was slippery because I'd been there, you know, I'd been there and earned my, <laughs> earned my stripes. And uh, so, so I come around the door and I could feel myself going. And I'm thinking, ah, ah I know what's going to happen now. I'm going to go. I'm going down. I am going down. But, but like a veteran, like a, like a veteran parachutist, I thought, if, if I just try and fight this, if I try and fight this and, and, and you know, uh, do this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hurt myself because it's like a concrete floor. I'm going to break a, a knee or a, or a hip or something because I was going at a, a full tilt. And I just thought, no, Adrian, just chill, just chill. So I, I, I slipped and I, in, in midair, I went into the free fall parachute position and I just landed. <laughs> and I landed, bang, like that. And you know, oh. two, two, 200 people looked around, but I, I pushed myself. I'd landed on my, you know, all, all, the, all my arms all of my legs, all of my body. And it was, yeah, it was a loud bang, but I, you know, I survived. <laughs> and it, I mean, unfortunately I didn't get it on, on film because it was rare. Oh, I was, I was just going to say, do oh. we have a blooper reel of all the, no, oh, no, they no, have no, a fall. The stay after free fall. Um, but yeah, it's because I didn't panic. And, and that's, you know, when you have experience and you just, you don't panic. You just think, okay, I'm going, bang, I'm going to land it. Mm, totally. I was working that was with my first Dawson. Day. And, um, and I, <laughs> even when I was watching the first season, yeah, he stood out, you know, he, oh, yeah. he stood out in season one. He's not what you'd call a conventional, you know, dark ages king. He, he played him much more subtly and just made it his own, didn't he? I mean, oh, my yeah. God. he killed it. Yeah. I mean, there will probably be other King Alfreds, but you're always going to go back to, to him. I mean, for me, what, there have been countless incarnations of, of Sherlock Holmes, but yeah. I started Sherlock Holmes with Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce. Okay. You know, do you, do you know what I'm talking about? Um, I don't know. No. That's, that's, that's Sherlock Holmes to me. My first is Robert Downey Jr., to be honest. <laughs> um, okay, okay. Well, I mean, he's, you know, he's, he's, no, no, I'm not taking anything away. I love his, his as well, but. Yeah, but yeah. Until that moment, Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce was my, was my um, Sherlock Holmes. And I think people in the future are always going to look to David Dawson's uh, Alfred as, as, you know, one of the great portrayals. Yeah, we totally hope they do. I've got, to, I've got to just tell you some other story on the first day because this is important and it'll, it'll bear in what I'm about to say later. We were also shown our costumes and I loved mine. And, you know, we were told to, you know, shave. I, I, I had a big beard. I grew a beard for this thing, a big beard. And they yeah. said, no, no, you, you're not ugly enough. So they had to shave most of the beard <laughs> off, really, really shave, really shave the head. I had scars everywhere. Anyway, then I, then I was sufficiently ugly to, to play the part. But we were getting the costume done and the, the prop guy comes in and he showed me, he said, this is your sword. And I looked at it. And I, I know quite a bit about this period, weapons of this period, because I've, I've studied this, one of my interests. I, I've been, you know, studying historical European martial arts and, and I'm into all that stuff. And he showed me the sword, which, is, which was manifestly not a dark age sword. Um, right. In those, in those times, you basically fought with a shield and an arming sword, and you defended with this, and you just sort of hacked with, with this other sword. The sword they presented me with, the Steapa sword, I, I love the sword, um, but it's a much longer blade, and it's got a much longer hilt, much longer handle, so you can use two hands, or a hand and a half, as they call it. Gotcha. And this, this, my sword looks much more akin to a sort of a 13th or 14th century long sword. By this time, the swords were longer and the handles were longer because they'd done away with the shield. You didn't need the shield anymore oh. because they weren't wearing male armor. You were wearing plate armor. And so you were, you were, you were protected against sword blows with your, with your plate armor. So you could, so you could give more of a, you know, gotcha. put more into it, basically. And you didn't need the yeah. shield because the shield was, was, wasn't necessary. And I told them all this. I said, this is too big. And I said, well, you know, we thought you were a big guy, so do you want it? And I thought, well, I, you know, in, in terms of aesthetic fighting, it's much more interesting to see a guy with a long sword doing 
two-handed moves and uh, dropping it and doing one-handed moves and, and the stuff that I can do than just <clears throat> so I said yeah fine I'll have it I, I the reason I mention this is because I was watching some online footage the other day of, of my friend from the show Mark Rowley who was telling a story um, he, he and Arnest were on stage and they were they were alluding to the fact that I'd, I'd said that Mark looks like a, a dog riding a bicycle when he's on a horse. Um, <laughs> because, because he, I, I, okay, you laugh, you're laughing. So I'm just going to tell you the whole story, all right? I'm going to tell you the whole story because I know, I know the viewers want to know about Mark. Mark is a great actor. He's a really, really good actor. But when I saw him first get on a horse when we do our training, I thought, there's a guy who's not ridden a horse before. And that's fine because, you know, not everybody has. And, you know, it's not a prerequisite of the show. It's kind of helpful if you do, if you have a bit of experience. Right. And he, he did look completely out of sorts. And it's really a backhanded compliment because Mark is, is a great actor. He's, he's good looking and he's, he's very inventive. And he's always comes up with something new. And it, it's just a surprise that he hadn't come with his A game in terms of his horse riding. I thought, you know, he would be more prepared than that. And he wasn't. And... I don't know whether he went away at, after season two and season and did anything in season three, but it didn't seem to me as though he had. He was still a dog on a bicycle. Uh, <laughs> it's still a backhanded compliment because he's such a good actor. And I thought you would have worked on that as uh, to, you know to have a full house, so to speak. And you, you might have noticed that video that I did of my behind the scenes and yeah. the dog on a bicycle at the end. And yeah. that was not in a malicious way. Um, that was that dog was doing really well on that bicycle. Um, <laughs> I, actually, I actually sped that, that footage up as in, in a celebration and a, and a sort of you know, a, a, a joy at the end of my little video. It wasn't to say, yes, you're still a dog on a bicycle. That dog is riding that bicycle very proficiently. Um, but, but Mark still felt the need to tell this story that, yeah, yeah, Adrian rocked up on the first day and said, give me the biggest sword you've got because I'm the biggest guy as though I'm some sort of really arrogant guy with a you know a, a small appendage myself and he needs to make up needs to make up for that by getting a bigger weapon and Mark that is a complete lie and it's not cool mate you know the true story because I gave you the true story so you've been caught out um Ooh. so my first day <laughs> And so the staff of Finn and rivalry was born right there. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, it wasn't born there. Actually, I'm, I'm going to tell you the, where it was born because that's also interesting. I've, I've always been interested in photography and I've, I've not until recently had a decent camera. I've always been a snapper on my phone. And going back to season two, I was always snapping shots. At that time, not many of the other cast, if any, really kind of liked that sort of thing, or they were a bit too cool for school for that kind of thing. Um, now, everyone on set is snapping for social media and you can't stop them. You know, they're pumping out photographs left, right and center. But back then it was like, oh God, he's taking photos. Oh, he's one of those. And I thought, yes, I am. I am one of those. Um, I don't mind being one of those because I want a permanent record of this. So just before the, the Viking raid on, the, on our tented village um, scene, we're all in on the edge of the woods in the summertime. We've got our sunglasses on and I, and I grabbed people. I knew there was gonna be some sort of reluctance, but I managed to herd everybody there and I gave somebody my camera and I said, can you just take this, can you just take this picture of us? And there was, there was Arnas and Mark, James the groom, Toby and, and Harry and myself. And there was a picture and I, and I put it out on social media when I was allowed to. And sometime later, this, this picture turns up on Mark's social media. And he said the, the Wessex band, we look like a rock band, basically, because a lot of us had sunglasses on. And <laughs> you look at the picture, Arnas looks incredibly cool, as, as he always is. <laughs> He's like one of the coolest guys I've ever met. Um, and, and Arnas is there sat against this tree with his shades on. And, um, and, there's, and there's Mark, I think he's got his shades on. And, 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 and then me without my shades on. And then somebody said, Adrian, why don't you try and look cool with your shades on? And I, and I replied on social media, I was just happy to be there. You know, I was not trying to, be cool. Anyway, Mark takes this picture and he says, yeah, the, the Wessex band on tour in Wessex, you know, this year or something. And he said, we've got Toby on vocals. We've got James on drums, somebody else on keyboards, me on guitars, Arna Soma, Adrian, the water boy. 
<laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. I said, and, and I thought, okay, it's kind of funny, but it's, it's, it's not really inclusive funny. You know, if he had given everybody a sort of a mock title and said, you know, you know they, they, everyone had a joke function in the band, that's fine. But to just be the water, well, I thought, mm, okay, fine. It's a joke. It's, to me, it's slightly misfired because it's not very inclusive. It's kind, of, it's kind of sneering. And I thought, okay, fine, whatever. Maybe he's just misjudged it. I've, I've done jokes in the past and they've been misjudged. And I thought they were funny and, and you know, other people didn't. So let it go. Mark's, a, I, I respect him immensely. He's a great actor. And um, I, I got him back with the bike, the dog on the bike. So it's all, it's all fair. Uh, but that's where it came from. It came from that picture, anyway. So, so the Finn and uh, sure. Stay Opera rivalry extends past the show a little bit. It was. We like <laughs> we like to keep it organic. <laughs> <laughs> so out of those scenes that are in the show, because they are some of the fans' favorite scenes, and we got a few people asking about if you had a favorite one uh, of the Finn and Stay Opera moments in the show. I, I, did, I did have a favorite scene. Really, kind of any any scene with Mark is is going to be good because he always comes with his A game. He's such a good actor. He will he will just work off you and you can work off him. You're both giving stuff. I knew that there was this kind of, oh, I call it sort of gobshite Irishman mentality in, in Finland who just can't, can't stop, you know, he can't stop. <laughs> and we have, the, we have this scene, Uhtred has, has, has slapped the priest, he's killed him and he's run off and, and, and the king, Alfred, has sent me to go and, and grab Uhtred basically and drag him back to the throne room and answer for his, his misdeeds. So Uhtred's holed up in his crib and he's got his men there, you know, he's got his band of brothers there, Arnus and, and, and Finnan and, and Citric and, and, right. and everybody else. And I've got my guys behind me, all my troops. Right. This is an official thing. And, and I knew what the lines were coming up. And the lines were basically, let, let, let me in or I'll blow your house down or actually burn it down. And Finnan says, well, over my dead body or something. I say, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step on your Irish. Yeah. Yeah, right. and, and, then, and then Hilt comes in and, and, you know, just like the no nonsense woman that she is, she can't stop being so silly. Let us, let us in. And I said, what, what's going on? You, you've let Hilt in. Ah, but we're afraid of, a, of the abbess. Right. <laughs> it's a big joke because we're, we're afraid of that tiny little woman who is, Hilt is very small. We're afraid of the tiny little woman, but we're not afraid of you, Steph. And I just thought, do you know what? There's no way in the world Steapa, the, the captain of the guard, um, a big, strong, not unintelligent man in front of all his subordinates is going to take that. But in the script, there, it just said nothing. There was nothing there for me to, to work against. I just had to take the insult. And I thought, that's not, that's not how it would be. And I thought, I've got to find a way of, of getting back at this. So I, I came, up with a, came up with a notion. And I, and I thought, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk around with this stick as though I'm just you know, on the way to, to pursue him, and I've got this stick, and it's just casually there in my hand. And when Finnan says, um, ah, but we're afraid of the Irish, we're afraid of the abbess, I'm just going to, I'm not going to go up to him and eyeball him and everything, because Stapa doesn't need to do that, because Stapa is just, you know, he's much stronger than Finnan, and, you know, he would just break him in two. And so I just take one step forward, look at him, and I have this stick, and I just go, and and I thought that's it. That will explain. That will just say everything. That will say everything. <laughs> I don't. I, I. don't need to give it this. I don't need to demonstrate my my strength because I am anyway. It just shows. It just says everything without saying anything. Right. I, and I. I wanted. I so desperately wanted to get this through. So I. I wrote to the director and I said, I've got this idea, and it's just. It's. It's. It's allows Steapa to say everything without saying anything. There's no change to the script. No, nothing. And he said, oh, I really like it. I really like it. Very stay up like To shoot it. And, and I told Mark I was going to do this. And he loved it. He said, oh, great. Fantastic. It gives me something to work with, you know. He's always after that, that bit of a sort of a frisson there. And the extras don't know, the, or the supporting artists don't know the scene. They don't know the, what the dialogue is. But we rehearsed it with the dialogue and without the stick. And, and then when we came, to, we came to shoot it, I, I, did, I came up to him and they said, ah, but we're afraid of the abbess. And I step forward and I go, and then all the guys behind Finn and, and, and uh, oh, they went, oh, <laughs> and all my guys behind me went, oh, and it was completely spontaneous. Nobody knew what was going to happen. And I just knew then 
that I'd got it absolutely right. I'd nailed it. It was just the right tone and it, because it said everything. And then the director comes trotting down the hill and he says, Adrian, we, we can't do the stick. Uh. So what do you mean we can't do the stick? Everyone loves the stick. So we can't do it. I said, what, what do you mean? I asked you about the stick and you said it was a great idea. And he said, yeah, we can't do the stick. I said, are you under instruction? He said, we can't do the stick, Adrian. Mm. The Last Kingdom is a no, really we couldn't do it. We couldn't do the stick. We couldn't, we couldn't do the stick. Um, so we just had to move on. But it just it was something that we could have done and, and we didn't do it. So that, that was the moment we could have done something. But I kind of got my revenge in the Finn and Stay up a duel when when Finn rocks up at the where were we? I think it was it. Were we in, in Winchester? Yeah, I think it was Winchester when was he comes Winchester back and, and he says, Oh, come on, big man, all we're guilty of is being hungry and thirsty and tired or something like that. Let us in, and I'm I'm just there with my yeah. <laughs> give it, I'll give it another couple of beats. Okay, let him in. <laughs> yeah, I kind of I kind of got him back. Yeah. yeah. Both great scenes. Both great scenes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, well, I love both of them. And, but yeah, all those scenes with Mark is because he's so, he's a very inventive and he, he's always, the thing about Mark, I'm just, I'm just paying him a compliment because I called him a, a, a dog on a bicycle before, but he's, he's a great actor. And he, the, thing, the great thing about Mark is he, he'll always make the scene about himself, which sounds like a bad thing. Um, he'll always make the scene about himself, but not to your detriment. He'll make the scene about himself and it's up to you to step up and, and, and reply, uh, which is a great challenge for an actor. Right. So I, I like elevates it. everyone's game. Like a people bit. like working with him because of those reasons. Gotcha. Um, so yeah. They still, and, and to be honest with you, I, I saw him uh, riding this year, not very much, but he looked all right. So maybe he has taken. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So Jen K wants to know if you had to play another character on the show, uh, who would you have liked to play? I've had, I've, I've been asked this before. I've always declined to answer it because I think it's an invidious question because it, it, it kind of implies that you think you could do better than somebody else. Um, so I, 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 I've declined, but I'll state here and now I could not have done better than Tobias or, or Rune. But yeah, I, I would have given my size and kind of demeanor. I would have loved to have had a, a crack at, at, at Ragnar, who, who I just, oh. think, you know, strong and noble and a good heart and a warrior. Totally. Well, I would have loved to have had a crack at that. And then just Uber is just an all out badass. <laughs> He's mm-hmm. awesome too. Kind of thing. Um, <laughs> not, not because I could have done it any better than those guys, because they, they did it brilliantly. But yeah, that, to give an answer to a question, which I normally don't answer. That's, oh. that's my answer. Cool. Cool. Very cool. Another question we had from a fan. It's from Ani. Uh, she wants to know if you had to spend quarantine with another character from The Last Kingdom, who would it be and why? <laughs> it definitely wouldn't be Mark Rowley. They would <laughs> drive me mad. <laughs> um, that's, that, is, that is an interesting question. I missed them when they weren't there in season. Well, sorry, they were there, but when I wasn't doing scenes with them. I missed Harry. I think Harry is a genius. I think I might have told some of the other cast this. I think actually Harry is a genius. He's so intelligent and articulate and he's always interesting. Um, and yeah, I, I would have liked to have spent time with him or Ian. Ian's always interesting as well. Ian, Ho- Ian, Ian Hart. Mm-hmm. There is footage out there somewhere of um, towards the end of season three. Uh, I, I wasn't there. They, a lot of them went off to do a karaoke thing and Harry was there and he did. Is it Evanescence, Wake Me Up? Wake yeah. Me Up inside yeah yeah yeah, it's evidence, yeah. <laughs> yeah from that from the movie with with ben affleck with big sorry was it ben affleck yeah ben affleck daredevil yeah yeah, yeah. all right yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i loved i loved that song well i i don't have it on my phone anymore because my i lost my phone but there is footage of harry doing that entire song all the vocal parts and it's honestly it's it's one of the most impressive things i've ever seen in my life Okay. <laughs> um, he's, he's absolutely aced it. So uh, if you ever get anybody else on here and they've, and they've got that footage, ask them to see that because it, I, I was in awe. Okay. We'll, we'll yeah, I, I, I really liked, I really liked uh, Harry. I, I got we had a great talk with him uh, I liked, earlier. I liked talking to him. We always had a good chat. We were always kind of sparred against each other. And um, yeah, I could, I could spend more time with him. Yeah. Uh, and Tobias as well, although I d- didn't have very much to do with him, he's just like a cool guy. 
Arnus as well. I mean, there's just so many guys. Yeah. It just seems like a great cast. You know. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, th I think, I'm not sure who, it, I think it was actually Harry that said when he did his first season and he explained to the new guys, the newbies, us coming into season two, he said, yeah, you know, normally when you, when you join a cast for whatever, a film, TV or, 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 or theater, something, there's always, there's always one. And, and in this, there isn't. Um, okay. Uh, well, that was, that was the case then anyway. They, they may well be now. Um, but, you know, brothers in arms kind of thing. Cool, cool. John Gray asked, uh, which of the characters from season one who didn't return for season two do you wish you had the chance to work with on the show? Uh, Rutger. <laughs> Rutger Howe. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say Rutger or... Or Abba, yeah, um, Runa. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, w w I mean, when I saw Runa, I thought, bloody hell, that they cast that well. He he aces that. Oh, yeah. Mm. It's too bad he dies so soon. I would have actually. liked to have just had scenes. With, oh, of course, I would have loved scenes with, with Rutger Hauer or Runa. Yeah, of course, those two. I, yeah, for sure. Cool. Those two. Cool. That'd be a cool um, meeting between uh, Stapp and Abba, too. I wonder how I, that would have went yeah, down. Yeah, I, I thought been... about that. That would be a... That would be a big match, wouldn't it? <laughs> that'd, that'd be a big brawl right there. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've, I've met him, actually. He's a really, really nice guy. Um, cool. I've met him at, um, at, at a couple of screenings. And yeah, he's really, really chilled out, down-to-earth, nice guy. He's awesome. We, we have talked to him some. Uh, we're, we're still trying to get him on the show. Yeah, uh, okay. Yeah, we'd love to talk like to him. a really nice guy. Yeah. He seems really he is, nice. He's a really good guy, yeah. Totally. So Rylan asks a couple things. First, she asks... If you had a spirit animal, what would yours be and why? And then she also asks, if she ever sees you in person, could she give you a hug? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, did you say a, a spirit animal? Yeah. Can you, can you tell me what that is? Oh, I, Steve's, Steve, yours would be like a wolf, right? Yes. Yeah, Something so like you're kind of you like your personality. With... Oh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. I see what you mean. A spirit animal. Yeah, okay. Uh, I would, I would, I would have gone with sloth. Oh, <laughs> sloth! <laughs> because because he's quite happy, quite happy being in bed all day. Um, but that's no, that's not me at all. Um, I would like to identify with a leopard. I think not the okay. biggest of cats, not not the biggest of cats, but a beautiful animal um, who keeps himself to himself uh, until the time is right to to make a killing, um, and. Yeah, I, 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 I like the underspoke or the un, understated leopard. That's what, that's what I, perhaps even a black mm. leopard. Ooh, or good it, choice. It's a panther, isn't it? It's a, a black panther. No, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stick with leopard. I'm cool. going to go with leopard. There's another set of questions here, and Steve and I are kind of wondering the same thing. Uh, yeah. Steapa, uh, you know, he goes on an adventure with Uhtred um, when, you know, he goes with Ragnar to save Uhtred, and then he's kind of hanging with Uhtred's group for a little while goes back to Alfred and still seems like to remain friends with Uhtred. Uh, so a couple people ask, and sorry if I butcher the names, I think Janelle, Janelle Romero and then Sam Zerks from um, Reddit, they asked, I'll, I'll read both questions. Do you feel Steapa ever wanted to join Uhtred or take pity in his cause? And the other question was, he suddenly gets the choice to serve who Steapa wants. Who is your choice? Okay. Um, I, I believe uh, Steapa to have been a great admirer of Uhtred in the early days. He has great respect for his, for his skills and, and perhaps for his free spirit. I, I think Stiappa is more of a bondsman to Alfred and he, he has a great debt of gratitude to, to, to Alfred because I, the way I played my character, he's, he's sort of a slave, orphan slave, who, who uh, Alfred takes pity on, gives him some sort of education and brings him up. And okay. so, Steapa owes him owes him everything basically. He's he's risen to the highest rank he could he could, um, yeah. and and it's all due to Alfred and his own skills. Obviously, although he might admire Uhtred's free spirit and his and his adventurous side, I don't think he would ever leave Alfred. Um, gotcha. Okay. And and I think I I, I think that the, the tendency to even want to explore that possibility kind of evaporated after he held the knife to, to, to King Alfred. There, there was a scene halfway through the season where we're, we're sneaking around London 
yeah. for the Vikings. I mean, it's all been deserted. Right. Uh, and Uhtred and I are, are, are sneaking around. You know, basically, I'm there to keep an eye on, on Uhtred, basically. That's the reason. I, I'm there to make sure he doesn't step out of line. And, and, and my, li my line to him um, is, um, I can't remember really what, it, what it was exactly, but it was, Lord, don't fail Alfred. Don't, don't go against Alfred or I will kill you. And, and I, that's like the pivotal, for me, that's like the biggest line that I had in that, in that season. Don't abuse Alfred or I will kill you. We, we were shooting this scene and it was like, like five to seven on the day we were shooting it. We didn't have time to do a rehearsal. We were running out of light, running out of time and, and we were creeping around and, and I didn't even have a chance to talk about it really. But so we just did one take and it was, Lord, uh, don't go against Alfred or I'll kill you. Uhtred says, don't be stupid, stay out there. And no, Lord, I will kill you. And Alex wanted to play it just for laughs. You know, don't be silly, don't be silly, um, stay out there. And, and, I, and, I, and, then, and then that was done. There was one take and we had to leave. That was, and and I, I was never happy with that. And I, I thought that's, that, that's, that's my biggest line in the season. I will kill you. I will kill the lead in this, in this season, the lead of this TV series. I will kill him. And he's not messing around. And you need to believe that, A, he has the capability of doing it. Otherwise, there's no point in being there in the first place. And that he will carry through with it. And, and Alex just wanted to play it as, as a laugh. And, and we didn't have time to reshoot it. And it just it really bothered me. And so I, I went to the producer and I said, you know, that was my, that was my seminal moment in, in, in the season. That was really important. And thankfully, three or four days later, this scene gets rescheduled. And I thought, oh, thank God, thank God. I'm going to get my moment. And so I saw this and we, and we got round to the day to shoot this. I was so looking forward to it. Um, and then just before lunch, I, I, I walked across the sort of the compound where all the trailers were and the producer said, Adrian, um, yeah, we're, not, we're not doing this, that scene anymore. I, I just, what? what do you mean we're not doing it? We're not doing it, Adrian. I just thought, mm. well, you know, what can I do? That was my best, that was my, <laughs> that was my scene. Um, and you just have to suck it up. I, I, you just have to suck it up. But that was a, a point of conflict, a point of interest, where Steyapa says to mm -hmm. uh, Uhtred, listen, I'm your mate. I, I really like you, but I will have to kill you. Yeah. If you step out of line. And I just think that was a... It was, anyway, that, that's not in the show. You didn't see that, and it was never filmed, and I never knew why. But, so that was, yeah, that was a nice moment of conflict, which kind of illustrated the point where he could have gone either way. But he was, he was with Alfred. Yeah, I think somebody in here asked what you would want the fans to know about Stayapa that wasn't in the show. So I think you kind of answered that with that uh, okay. a little bit too. Well, I mean, there's, God, there's, when, I, when I took the role, the, sort of the early directors and the, and the first producer we had just said, you know, this, this is not a massive role. Stayapa is not a massive role, but it's a really important role. You're mm -hmm. not going to have less amounts of dialogue. You're just going to get the occasional line here and there. But what you will say is always going to be important. It's always going to be important to the plot. It's going to have great significance. It has worth. Your character will be demonstrated through, through your actions, through you are the battlefield warrior. You, know, you are going to be the invincible, um, omnipotent presence on the battlefield. You, are, you can kill anyone and, and you are super strong and you are dependable and, and all of this thing. Obviously, we can't say this. Well, you're not going to be able to say, you're just going to have to demonstrate. So, yeah, I mean, I, I was all, all down with, with playing, you know, a, a character that said, that said very little, but, but did much with the import of those few words and, and, and his deeds. Totally down with it. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I don't know whether you saw Band of Brothers, which was an HBO show from like 2002, three, something like that. Really okay. successful, long-running TV uh, serial, and it's about this very inspirational uh, guy, Captain Winters, who trains a whole bunch of guys from the 101st Airborne, uh, goes through training, and he lands with them on the parachutes out into Normandy on D-Day. They land, they fight their way through Normandy and to Belgium and Holland and, and Germany, and they end up at the concentration camps. And he's just a massive inspirational, just kind of a Ragnar type leader, you know, right. um, worthy of respect and just a decent all round human being. He's the star of the show, but there's this other character who's, you only see occasionally, you know, he might utter a word or two here, 
but he lives by his reputation or his he exists his character exists by reputation of, of what he has done in the past he's just a badass guy that has this reputation for not messing around you're always wondering is this guy gonna gonna do anything his name is captain spears and then finally one day there's this massive encounter they're attacking baston which is or bastone uh, in in belgium i think in the in the Ardennes forest and there's this big firefight and captain spears just, just does the most extraordinary heroic thing he goes from his own lines across this enfiladed field of german machine gun fire hooks up with his his sort of squad on the other side and then runs back through this field of fire and everyone's just you're just you're, you're speechless because you how on earth can anyone do that and it's just the most extraordinary act of heroism that scene is a payoff for all the little little bits of dialogue and and allusions to this badass guy that's just exists through 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 rumor and 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 hearsay but they they pay off in that one scene and he does very little else in the rest of it and it's called it's called uh, Chekhov's gun after after the great okay. uh, playwright Anton Chekhov and he established this principle if you introduce a pistol in the first act you've got to use it by the by the third act otherwise people are going what's the what's that pistol for that pistol is a threat it's interesting and you mm. And if you don't, then it's just like a red herring. It's just like, oh God, why did you bother, why did you bother putting the pistol there if you're not going to fire it? If you, if you introduce the pistol in the first act, you've got to fire it by the third act. And I always thought that was how Steapo was. He doesn't get a chance to do a lot of stuff, but he exists through what other people say about him. He's a great warrior and he's, he's dependable and, and all these things. So I was always, always living in hope that I would get my Captain Spears moment, that I, I live through the, through, the, through the notion of other people, through the, through the ideas of other people. He's going to be there. He's going to protect us. He's dependable. He's strong. We've got, we've got Uchir on the left. We've got Steapa on the right, whatever that line is. And they're going to give me that, that big payoff one day. So I was always, you know, and, and I thought it was going to happen at the end of, the, of season one where I have a big fight. I, I, I had a massive fight. Uh, choreographed and you know I'll maybe talk about that in a minute I think the, the very first example I had was when where, where, Uch, where Steapa was going to demonstrate all of these qualities these dependable steadfast strong reliable qualities the very first time it was demonstrated is when we were approaching Dunholm up this up this huge cliff and Bioko is meant to fall off this cliff and I'm meant to grab him and, and hold him one-handed basically off this cliff so he's sort of almost dangling there I mean, I don't think we were going to do quite dangling there, but I was certainly holding his life there. Okay. And it was a moment of, of tension, and it was, it was a demonstrate a silence demonstration that Steapa was strong, dependable, wouldn't let you down, and all of these things. And I thought, okay, great. You don't have to say anything, but I've demonstrated this in my first act. And we got to, we got to do it, and, and Ian just said he didn't want to do that. He, I, don't know, I don't know why. Um, but he said he didn't want to do that falling off the cliff thing. Um, and you know, I great respect for Ian. Um, he's a lovely man, brilliant actor, and uh, yeah, you just have to respect that. He, he didn't want to do it, so he didn't want to do it. So okay. what actually happened was that in, instead of uh, Bayaka falling off the cliff, he just slid down on the soles of his shoes into my chest. And yeah, you catch him. Slightly, slightly comic moment. Uh, so the show got a comic moment, but it didn't get its first moment of Stiapa showing that he's dependable in a tight situation. And there, there were a lot of those moments. At, at the end of Dunholm, uh, at the end of the season one, we, I had this massive fight um, where I'm protecting Ethelfled, and I have, a, I have, a, I have an ax and, a, and, a, and my long sword. And I take out about six guys. There were all sorts of problems with, with the shoot. Um, I won't bore you with that. But yeah, we shot the fight and didn't get included, you know? Mm. Um, uh, but I thought, okay, we got to the end of the, end of the season. This is my pistol moment. This is the Chekhov's pistol. We've loaded it. We told everybody how good Steapa is. And now he's going to demonstrate that he's going to take out these six Danes. Gone. Mm. So, you know, you just have to suck it up and move on. So that was, there was another moment there, which, which didn't get realized. I mean, we move on to, to, to season two. And actually, there's another, this is an allusion back to, back to Leofridge. In season two, when we are in, I can't remember what town, what, um, but we, we con the Vikings, we con the Danes into thinking, that we've ridden out with all the money 
the, the sort of the wagon we pretend it's it's upset on on the sort of the little stream and leave all the coins there for the vikings and, and the danes and, the, yeah. and then we go charging out after them and i'm i'm behind the walls with all the men that we've got hidden there and i'm mustering them and i have these lines saying okay men we're going to go out there we're going to pursue them we're going to kill them and, but i don't say that i i say we're going to and then we're going to kill the bastards and i read this and I, and I said, hang on, kill the bastards. That sounds a bit familiar. And I, and I, yeah. <laughs> familiar. That is Leofrich from season one. We're going to kill the bastards in his, you know, his northern, his Yorkshire accent. We're going to kill the bastards. And I, and I, I thought, oh. so I, I went to the producer and I said, are you sure you want to say this? Because this is, this is me alluding back to Leofrich. Can I not just say, can I just say we go and we kill them? Not we kill the bastard because that's what Leofrich said. He said, no, I want you to, to, to allude to Leofrich. And I thought, well, why, why do I have to allude to Leofrich? Why can't I have some lines that support my character instead of my character just facilitating someone that's died? No, Adrian, we want you to say, like, we want you to say the line because it alludes to... Right, okay. <laughs> so, you know, there was a chance there for Stiappa to say his own kind of battle cry, but he didn't. He had to say Leofrich's. And, 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 you know, there were, there were other battle scenes, you know, at the end of, at the end of season three, I rehearsed it and, and it was a very minor scene and, and I suspected that it wouldn't even be included because it was so small. I thought, you know, come on, four move fight, they, no one's going to even bother to edit that together. Um, so I, I knew I wasn't going to get a fight at the end of season two. Um, so yeah, there were many, there were many chances for there were many more chances for Steapa to do more than you saw but you know for whatever reason they they chose not to include those we do want to hear about like um your what your favorite scenes were to shoot because uh, one of ours okay. is one of ours was when you go to Dunholm and when Uhtred tells you Steapa get the door and you just cut oh. through these guys it's just <laughs> phenomenal and then you just lift the the huge heavy bars oh. that doesn't look like one man could lift and you just throw right. them off it's it's a it's really an awesome sequence. Well, um, Colby, I, I love doing that sequence. Um, but I, I you you don't know what I was going through, and, I, and I'll, maybe I'll tell you now. I was in a lot of pain doing all of that stuff. Uh, uh, obviously, you have to work out when when you're playing like a role like that. But you have to try and keep some sort of bulk um, gotcha. throughout the season. And so you know, there's an imperative to keep going to the gym. About a week before we started doing those Dunholm sequences. And I was in the gym and I was just, I hadn't warmed up properly and I, I was stupid. I just tore my calf really badly. I bounced Ooh. the calf raise machine and I tore it. I know you guys are, are physios. Yeah, yeah. I just, it was horrible. It was absolute. I, I don't know. It was horrible. It was a oh. horrible, horrible tear. And I was, I couldn't move. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I did the whole, you know, rest, ice, compression, elevation thing. And I, and I went home and, and I thought, I'm in a real problem. I've got a real problem now because I've got to do this, this fight where I take out all these guys at, at Dunham. And I cannot, I can't go to the to the physio, the doctor, or, or the paramedic, or whatever. Because if if I do, they're going to just say, "Well, you can't do those scenes." Mm, um, yeah. You know, just, you're just going to rip that open again. And they wouldn't let me do it. And I thought, God, I'm having enough trouble getting in this show as it is. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm not going to give away my one moment of of battle um, action. So I I just I just had to tape it up. I had ibuprofen and just taking whatever I could. <laughs> And, and the first worry, the first concern was, was, the, um, was that sequence where we come out of the woods. Uh, we sort of, it's at, at night oh, yeah. out of the woods and, and, and the Dunhelm Castle is, is 20 yards across the sort of open ground. It's kind of like a, um, a great escape moment where you, we're 20 yeah. short, send up <laughs> 20 feet of rope. <laughs> kind of moment. Um, <laughs> So we see the castle and, and we come out of the tree line and we have to run across. And, and you might recall that, that uh, Ethelwald does a sort of comedy fall. And yeah. We all line up against the wall. And I'm thinking, I'm about the last guy to do this. And I think, I don't, I don't know how I'm going to do it. How can I run? And I, right. and I, and I thought, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to try and hide it. I'm going to do a sort of a, a one-legged shuffle, a fast shuffle. And I thought I could hit, I thought I could hide it by doing that. I had it all strapped up. And sure enough, I got there. But because when you stop, you're really engaging the, your calf muscle. Right. 
know, you, you, you're really engaged in it. I thought, I, I'm not going to be able to stop. Uh, so, well, I'm not going to be able to stop. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, it's not a real car. It's not a real uh, uh, stone wall. It's, you know, it's, it's wood and plaster and everything. Okay, so yeah. Get, you know, Uhtred goes and, and everybody else goes and Ethelwald Ethel does his comedy fall and then Stamp has turned and he gets up and he bolts it across and he's sort of half-legged shuffle thing and he runs it and he just because i can't stop just bang into the wall <laughs> yeah I, I remember this I, why did benjamin run into the wall and they go oh, it's, it, i think it's his character choice because he's stay out and he's really hard <laughs> we, do the sec, we, do the, we do the second take and i do the one-legged shuffle thing across and i run into the wall again <laughs> it's done it again Oh God, he must be really hard. It was because I couldn't stop. All I could do was just <laughs> run into the wall. I just had to run into the wall. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that, that whole battle thing was, was uh, I was thinking, God, just, just hang in there, baby. Hang in there. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. As, as, as uh, Hans Seller would say, don't worry, baby. She'll hold together. <laughs> she'll hold together. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, I got through it. Um, uh, it was... I. I I knew I was in safe hands because um, uh, John East was directing it. And yeah. he's just, I remember when he was, when I was in the makeup uh, trailer, getting made up for, uh, I think, an, uh, an earlier episode. And, and I just saw this, this wad of paper in front of me. It was about 15, 20 sheets of A4 with really intricate writing and details and drawings and diagrams of exactly how he was going to, it was a battle plan, right? How he was going to construct the battle of of Dunholm Castle, and it it was it was the most the most extraordinary thing I've ever seen. How he uh -huh. so he knew where, exactly where everybody was at every moment, um, and where the crowds were coming and where we were going, and and I just thought I can't wait to work with this with this guy, you know. Yeah. Uh, so I knew we were in safe hands, and it, and it came to came to my moment, and I was I was so hungry, I was. I, I, <laughs> I didn't want to have a big lunch and then try and fight on a big lunch. Right. Three, four o'clock in the afternoon before I'd eaten. So I've, I've got to do my fight first. So I was kind of fighting on empty. I did it. It was a couple of takes and it worked. And, I, you know, I was happy with it. And it's, you know, it's on my fight reel now. Uh, check it out. Nice. Folks. Uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, I was really happy with it. And it's like, a, yeah, it's, it's, it was a hero moment. You know, um, <laughs> I, I remember at the time, Actually, it's just come back to me now. I remember at the time being a child and watching Vikings with Kirk Douglas. I don't know whether okay. you've seen. Have you seen that movie? No. I don't. Tony Curtis and Kirk Douglas. Yeah. Okay. They play essentially brothers, brothers and uh, opposing brothers. One's a Viking. One's a one's a uh, Anglo-Saxon, I suppose. There's a sequence where they're attacking the castle, and they have to cross this moat. The drawbridge comes up, and they can't get in. Obviously because there's water. So all the Vikings, all the Danes have to keep, they charge up to the, to the, to the drawbridge and they throw their axes into the, into the wall, into the drawbridge and they stick in. Yeah. Gives him something to hang on to. And then Kirk Douglas pegs it along, chucks himself over the, over the, the water and grabs onto the axes That's sweet. And, and gets a drunk, comes up uh, and lowers the drawbridge and lets everybody in. And I remember at the time I was thinking, this is my, this is my Kirk Douglas moment. This is <laughs> I open the, open the, the, the gates of Dunham and everybody comes in and I thought, Oh my God, I, I'm doing this. You know? Yeah. I loved it. They, so, they yeah, pretty much a... left uh, Stiafa to do everything. They were just like, all right, Stiafa, get the gate. And there's, there's guards over there. There's all the things they, like, they have to hold everyone. <laughs> they're holding everyone off. They're just like, let him by himself. I mean like, well, yeah, I, I think it worked. It's on my oh, you show. You killed it. So uh, I, and you yeah, killed yeah. those dudes. <laughs> I'm going to open yeah, the door. Yeah. But you also killed yeah. the scene. It was awesome. <laughs> oh yeah. I, I don't know. I, yeah. I, 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 yeah. I mean, that was, I'm afraid that was it, really. Um, in in terms of 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 Stay Up as fighting, um, they we never really saw him fight again. I was so disappointed at that, um, and I kept holding out for my pistol moment, and it, and it and it never really came. But yeah, I mean. I, I loved that sequence and I put my heart and soul into it. It um, is one of the better sequences. I remember sure. talking yeah, to the extras yeah. uh, who were playing all the, the, the Viking, you know, um, what's his name? Kjartan. 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 Kjartan's castle. 
and I said, guys, when we, when we, when we roll on this, I'm really going to come for you, you know, so just, just be careful. And I, as you see, I, yeah. And uh, they loved it. They, okay. they gave, you know, just like any actor gave them something to react to. So, you know, when somebody's charging at you with a big ax and a sword. And, <laughs> yeah. You know, so yeah. They Six loved four, it. And I, and I loved it too. And, four, um, dude. <laughs> yeah. It was, uh, yeah. Even, even the, even the, um, the cameraman said, yeah, that was, it was your day today. And it was. That was a great, yeah, it was really, yeah. a, really a great scene. We also love um, in that season three, episode one, when you do yell shield wall, because we love our shield walls and, and you do get a pretty cool shield wall yell. So we, we also enjoyed that very much. I, listen, guys, I got to tell you, unfortunately, exactly the same thing happened in season three. Um, <laughs> I, I got onto the set of, of season three. And as I told you, they, they shoot the, the, the palace scenes at the, the first week of, of the season before they go out to the out of town thing. And I'd been there doing the palace scene, standing behind Alfred's throne for four days. And it was, this is the winter season. So it was cold, you know, it's the cold concrete floor. There's no heating in there. And I was, you know, stood there doing my stay up thing. We got to sort of Thursday afternoon and hadn't got time to do the scene that was scheduled as often happens. Uh, and so we just had like five minutes left of the day. And they thought, well, let's just let's just do that scene where Steppa runs down the corridor um, after Uhtred when he does the knife to the king as a fill-in to use the last five minutes. And they said, okay, you, you find doing this, and it's just, you're just running down the corridor saying guards or something, whatever. And I said, yeah, fine, fine. Didn't didn't think about it. Of course, I've been stood on that floor for four days, done very little exercise. I gotcha. it's cold. I've been there for sort of eight nine hours. I hadn't warmed up or anything, and you know how important this is. Um, and yeah. I ran down, ran down the corridor, hadn't warmed up, and I got sort of two thirds of the way down, oh, and I and I sprained my. It was the it was the other calf, the uh. other this time. And then we did another take, and so I, I was a bit more careful the second time, but I could feel it. Yeah. And 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 you know I was wise, and I thought, oh, Jesus, oh what? So I went back to the hotel and I put ice on it rest ice compression elevation again. I thought, I cannot believe this has happened. Anyway, it was fine. Two or three days go by and I've forgotten all about it. It was just, it right. was just a little sprain. So I'm back in the gym trying to, you know, work out again. And I'm squatting. And that, that sprain was obviously stressed and loaded and it became a massive rip. And it was one of the most painful things I've ever experienced in my life. It was far worse than the one I had in the previous season. And I was, oh man! You know, I was almost blacking out. I just sort of racked the racked the bar, and I and I almost crawled out of the gym. Um, yeah. I went back, put the ice on it, and I thought I've got a real problem here. I've, I've got to do this scene in, in three days, and I'm in exactly the same situation again. But, but I can't tell them again. It's a different leg this time. I can't tell them. And what I should, I mean, what I should have said to, to them is, no, I can't run down that corridor in the next five minutes because I've been stood here for eight hours. I'm cold. I need to warm up. And it was, that was my fault for not recognizing that. So that, this would be a lesson to all you, if there's any actors out here watching this and they ask you to do something like that, don't do it unless you're happy because you're going to get injured, you know? Yeah. Um, as I was. And it was really significant because... I couldn't train on that leg for another six months, really. So I, and, I, and I couldn't tell anybody because they would have just cut me. They would say, well, we can't do that. We can't have you on a horse, jumping down from the horse, running into battle. So I just had to keep quiet about it and do the sort of the one-legged shuffle thing again. Into, uh -huh. um, you know, fortunately, they didn't give me a massive sequence again. But yeah, it was, it was, it was painful for the, for the entire rest of the season. Uh, it, was a mass, it was a massive injury. Um, yeah. Because I wasn't, so yeah, I was in pain doing that all that's that sequence again a lot of people in uh had questions about season four and unfortunately we do lose stay up in season four um so i think we should get to that steve do you have anything else before we get there no yeah just as we're gonna get into the season four territory here okay uh, and stay up yeah he he did meet his end in episode four of the fourth season during the battle at teton hall um, and a lot of fans are just asking about that. Uh, you know, how did you handle your death? What was it like? Uh, when did you, you know, first find out about it? When did you first find out? Okay. Um, 
I, I first found out, well, I mean, <laughs> Uh, there, there's, there's a line in Julius Caesar, it's Julius Caesar's line, the Roman Shakespeare, uh, Shakespeare's play, wh where Julius Caesar says, uh, cowards die many times before their death, but the valiant taste of death but once. And, and that's not an allusion to me being um, valiant in battle and, 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 and being a coward in battle or not, but I, I felt like I, my character had died many times throughout the previous two seasons. All these little things that didn't go my way. Mm. Um, and there was another one, I've got to be honest with you. There was, I've just got to tell you this other one. There was, when, at, at that battle of Dunhelm, I'm, I'm, I'm shouting shield wall again, former shield wall. And I say to my men, shield wall. And the director came out and he was a decent guy. He said, hey, you've got to lose the whistle. I said, what do you mean lose the whistle? I'm whistling to my men across a battlefield. We, we can't have the whistle. I said, why not? He said, it's not my issue. Producer said it's too too modern. I said a whistle too modern. I mean, people have been whistling forever. Uh, she said, "Well, you can't whistle." And I thought, "Okay, fine, whatever." I, I'm, I'm pretty sure people have been whistling for a long time. Um, anyway, I let it go until I saw the season two come out, and I saw Perlig doing his duel with the with the Danes in London. They put right. him in the rostrum, and he's having a fight. I think he, he betters his, 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 his opponent and then puts his, his, his weapon down, his, his sword down. He doesn't just put it down, he puts it down as a mic drop. And we <laughs> all know what's going on there. That was a mic drop. You go back and watch that and anyone will tell you that was a pearly mic drop with the sword. <laughs> and I thought, I don't know how long people have been doing mic drops, but it's, it's, it's no longer than 20 years at the most. And I wasn't allowed to whistle. And so there were, you know, there, I, I could go on, but I'm not going to bore you. There were, there were many examples of, of the things which Stafford couldn't do for whatever reason. And I just felt there's like a little death inside. When I saw my fight sequence for the end of season two, which was four moves, I, they showed it, the, the, the stunt coordinator showed it to me and he said, I said, show me, the, show me my sequence then because I was looking forward to it. It's the, it's the end of season fight and stay up as here to get his pistol moment. We've been waiting because we've all, you know, been built up, the, the pistol's there. Are we going to fire the pistol? Are we going to have the stay up a fight? And there was four moves and I, and I realized then that you don't really want me to do these. You don't really want me to do this sequence because it's not a sequence that's not even worth filming. It's, uh, it's, it's almost there to, to sort of keep me quiet for an afternoon. And I realized then that it was all over for me. If I was coming back to do a season three, it would be just to die. So yeah, that, that was when I realized that I, I wasn't, they didn't state that. We, you know, season four comes round and, you know, they, they did offer me a contract and, and I gladly took it up because I wanted to, you know, finish it. And, and, I, and I've got to say that if you are an actor, and you are taken on into a show, you don't have to do it, you know? And if you don't like the part, and if you don't like what's happening to you, you can just walk, you know, you don't have to come back to do another season for, for good reasons or bad reasons. Um, you're just there to implement the story, the director's vision. Sometimes it's nice and sometimes it's not. I mean, but you got paid and sometimes that's what happens. I, I know many, many fans have said, what on earth happened to Stay Apple? Well, nothing that hasn't happened to him already, basically, except it was happened. It happened quicker and and more quieter. <laughs> so yeah, I knew certainly by that last battle of season three that it was all over for me, or I suspected it would be. And and I was frustrated that it was all over a lot earlier than that, to be honest with you. And they they obviously didn't want me, and that's fine. You know, shows change direction and and people move on. So I know it was a, like a massive shock to, to the fans. It was an ineluctable inevitability to me mm. and, I, and I feel sorry for the fans because they invested time and e emotion in, into that character and they wanted, you know, they wanted Stay Apa to, to at least have his, his pistol moment. They wanted to have it, his Captain Spears moment. He doesn't get it at the end of season three. At least he's gonna get it in this battle. I suspect a lot of people thought Stay Apa probably wouldn't make it through this season, but at least he's gonna get a battle sequence. Yeah, I rehearsed and I, and, I, and I knew this and I thought, okay, they've, they've cut my dialogue. I'm not going to get any, anything worthy of speaking 
this season, but I'm going to get my fight. I spoke to Levente, the, the stunt guy, and, and Tamas, his sort of um, lieutenant who, who actually coordinated my fight. And I had a great sequence. It was really kick-ass. It was brutal stay upper, kind of kicking people, wrenching their heads. You know, just, it was, it was in fact, my instruction to him was, you know that sequence out of Rogue One where Darth Vader comes through at the end? I said, yeah. that is what you've Love got it. to do from stay upper, all right? <laughs> you've got this guy that just- Just force goes, throw him up. Yeah, just all around. <laughs> that's what I got. I, got I was lifting people up. And that's in the, that's in the, that's in the mm -hmm. choreography. I come along, I just rip the shields off, slash them, put them in the air, sh uh, swords turning around. I kill nine guys, all right? There are, two, there are two short sequences, and I kill nine guys. And I was really happy with it. Yeah, sure enough, they didn't show it. Uh, literally thousands of people have written in and said, where was the Appa's moment? Either fighting or where was his, you know, uh, funeral oration? Yeah, it doesn't bother me about the funeral oration, but we didn't get the fight. And, and that's, you know, that's just down to editing and, and direction and, and choices. So there was a fight. I killed nine guys in quite some style. They didn't put it in, unfortunately. Again, but I, I said, you know, these things happen. In, in terms of the actual death, yeah, the, the head thing. Um, <laughs> I was surprised at that. I, I, for a show that has grounded itself in, in truth and reality, and that's his, that's his backbone, that's his mainstay, the kind of exploding um, watermelon head um, just kind of jumped out at me personally. And it, it, just, it just wasn't that truthful. It, 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 to me, it evoked a sort of a, a roadrunner cartoon. You know, Wiley e. Coyote, he's fallen off a cliff or something with an anvil falling on his head and it squashes him. It was like a, a Wiley e. uh, roadrunner cartoon directed by Sam Peckinpah. You know, if, if, if we'd seen my head split open and, and a bit of bone, a bit of bone and a bit of gray matter, that would have looked even more realistic, but to have an exploding watermelon, <laughs> it's kind of it just kind of jumps out at you. Think, Where, where's that come from? But you know, maybe other people think it was great. It did. It jumped out to us too. It seemed like maybe they're going for some different shock value. But overall, we the blood spurting and everything this season was more than the previous seasons. I, you know, I'm sure. I'm sure that is true. But I, I I think that's because that is actually necessary. We need to see that. I think it's, I think if anything, it's toned down in, in other seasons. And it was toned down because, you know, initially it was the BBC and then it was the BBC stroke Netflix. And, and then last season it was just Netflix. So, so there, there is a progression, I think. So yeah, I'm, I'm happy to see more blood because obviously you would see more blood. Uh, I, that, that didn't worry me. The exploding head, I, I think perhaps on reflection, they might make a different choice if, if they mm. did. Again. <laughs> so Lamonte Levon Sutton asked, how would you have scripted your death? Th th there's no issue there. I, I have no issue with dying. I'm, I was entirely happy with that, with that battle sequence, getting off the horse, charging into battle, having my Darth Vader moment, and then, and then getting, getting killed. That was fine. I, I think originally the script said, stay up or wade through the battle, killing people left, right and center, just hacking people down. We see the you know, monster that he is. And I'm thinking, this is what I've been waiting for. You know? Finally, okay, I'm out of the show, but I'm gonna get my moment. And then it says, stabbed from behind. And I thought, really? So I'm just, I'm stabbed from behind by an unknown assailant, literally in the back. I think possibly one of the other directors said, come on, is that the best you could do for Adrian? Given how he's done in the show, and I think maybe they changed the death from just getting stabbed in the back with a sword, which is the cheapest death. If you get that death, that means, look, thanks for coming, but you know we we didn't really want you in the show anyway. <laughs> if you get a spear in the back death, that's 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 over. And I think that's what I was lined up to get, but I, I, maybe I'm wrong. Anyway, so it, whatever it was originally, it became the getting knocked over by the horse, and 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 I actually liked that. I mean, I thought that's going to happen in battle. Yeah, I thought. And you fine. save you save Edward right before that too. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I thought it's a good way to go, but it was only a good way to go if you see him killing people, killing the nine people first. And if you don't see that, it's just like, what? Seth has got off the horse and now he's dead. What? So, so that's what I, I, I feel sorry for the fans. They didn't get to see me fight. I'm sorry that I didn't get to see me fight. 
but believe me, it was a long, I saw it coming a long time um, ago. Yeah, I mean, th I just want to say thank you to all the fans that, that, that have expressed dismay and anger and sorrow and, and, and just lament. I'm sorry about that. I wish I could have given you something else. I really do, because I, I love Stefan and I didn't want any, anything more from him. I didn't want any more lines. I just wanted him to do the lines he did and have the battles that were, were scripted and, you know, onwards and upwards. Hopefully he left an impression and, you know, totally I think, to, yeah, you know, to work with David Dawson, you know, yeah. I had scenes with David Dawson. I'm going to remember that for a long time. Totally. Even through all the challenges that you did go through, we, we really think Steapa still came out as, as a, a really great character for The Last Kingdom. And we loved you uh, on the show. Steapa was always one of our favorites. Um, so even through all the challenges you went through, we still think you did a great job. So well, we just want you to know that. I, and I loved it. I, I absolutely loved playing Steapa. It, 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 was, it was a dream. And I'm, I'm sorry there wasn't more fighting for the fans because I, I know the fans um, have an image of Steapa in the books and he's much more prominent in Uhtred's life um, and he saves Uhtred many many times and they obviously mm. didn't want somebody else saving Uhtred they, they wanted Uhtred to save himself I guess uh, and, and I think there's a little bit of confusion sometimes a bit of a dissonance between the staffer that people imagine in the books and the staffer that they allowed me to play I you know and, and I know you maybe wished for the staffer in the books but they definitely weren't going for that so you know I did what I could. <laughs> did you watch the rest of season four after? And oh my god, did I watch? Man, I watched the whole thing in twelve hours. <laughs> I, I binged it. Um, oh yeah, let, let me, actually, yeah. Let me talk about this because I told you I was a massive fan of the show. Massive fan, genuine yeah. massive fan. It's, it's like a, getting on the show was a massive dream come true. Cool. I binged it from season one. I, I, I watched the first two episodes of season one, sort of live on the TV. And I thought, I, I can't wait a week. I, so I, I saved them up and I, I watched the other sort of six in a binge um, because they go so, so much happens so quickly and you, you just want more and more and more. Right. So, so yeah, I binged season two, binged season three and, and, I, and I just took my computer outside and I sat in the sun with a hood over the thing and, and watched, watched the 10 episodes with a sort of a sun guard. And I did it in 12 hours and wow, yeah, I mean, I, I, it, was gonna, it was always going to be interesting for me to see how they coped with the loss of David because David, you know, Alfred was, was just, he was just enormous. Yeah. And, yeah. and he was like the backbone of the show. And, and I thought, well, they're obviously going to have to introduce new characters and, and probably more battles. And they did both. And I thought Uhtred's son, Finn, I thought he was extraordinary. I thought he did an yeah. Amazing, yeah. amazing job. <clears throat> yeah, just really, really stood out. But the one that really stood out for me was, was Eliza. I mean, she's, she's totally. always good, but she was always kind of subordinate to, to Alfred. Now she's, well, she's not, she's not preeminent there because obviously her son Edward is, but, but her, I thought her acting was just, every time she came on, it was almost with that anticipation that, oh my God, David Dawson's coming on. Um, it's, Eliza's coming on again. This is going to be good. Um, I thought Millie was great. I liked yeah. the scene between Millie and Uhtred. I liked Uhtred being a bit more vulnerable, a, a less less powerful this year, showing a sl slightly weaker side. Oh, and and the new the new the new Dane Sig Trigger. Yeah, I, he's he, he's really charismatic, isn't he? He's cool. He's really cool. I'm excited to yeah, see where, what they do with him. Yeah, yeah, he's one to watch. That I really like that character already. Yeah. So I, I the only thing I the only thing I had a bit of an issue with was the um, was, was was the Heston hanging the guys upside down in the tree. The, the uh, um, no, Trudeau Bevan, but I expect you to die. Kind of, sort of leave, leave him there with a laser, with a you know, with a ticking time bomb or with a laser coming between his legs. Come on, Heston's come a classic on. James Bond villain. It you was, know? Thank, you, thank you, Steve. It was classic James Bond. Yeah. Um, so I did have a bit of an issue with that, but and obviously my exploding head. <laughs> but I, <laughs> but um, no, I loved it. I, I absolutely loved it. Um, and you know, good luck to the guys. Uh, that are still left, still alive. Um, obviously, they're going to be going on to do, you know, I, I imagine, that, well, like, they can't not do season five now. It's, got, it's so popular, isn't yeah. it? It's, num it's like number yeah. one on, on, on IMDb. Yeah, um, it is. One show in the world. It's the number one show in the world. Yeah. 
Um, and congrats, on, by the way, for being a part of that. That's, that's yeah, really awesome. Congrats well, on that. Well, you know, mine a part of it, but yeah, I, it's nice to be a part of it. And 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 good luck to them. Um, I'm, I'm doing doing a winter in Budapest is a is a big ask. It's, yeah, they they will become a band of brothers if they get through that because uh, it is it is it is cold. So you know, good luck to them. And uh, I yeah, I I, I love the show. It was it was different. It was always going to be different. I, I, maybe some people like different or maybe some people are complaining because it's not the old show but i enjoyed it i in fact yeah. i loved it let's be honest i loved it <laughs> yeah same here yeah we loved it and, and we um, love stay up we, we we're gonna miss stay up in the future um but we, we totally love stay up so well, uh well thanks guys and i love your thing and I, i'm looking thank forward you. to you know who you get on next and um i hope you i hope you continue to grow i um, appreciate that thank and, you thank um, you no, no, seriously, you, you're really cool, and um, I'll be watching. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah. Well, before we go, we just want to know what can we expect. And a few, you, few fans have asked us. I won't name them all, but um, a few fans have asked what we, what can we expect from you in the future. Um, well, probably Adrian Boucher on a sword with a horse. That's that's, <laughs> <the best. laughs> um, <laughs> that's always a good bet. Uh, I've got a couple of films coming out, two or three films coming out, or parts in two or three films coming out later. In, I assume later in the year, but I just don't know with the, you know, with the releases, with the with the lockdown and everything. So yeah, a couple of films later this year. I I was doing a, a TV show, um, and hopefully going to go back to that. I'm I'm really enjoying it. it it's kind of everything that Stayapa wasn't. He's not humble. He's he's a fighter and a lover and. Okay a politician and, and a bit more arrogant than, than staff. So it's all the sides that I didn't get to play as staff, <laughs> um, and I still get to do it on a horse with a sword. So yeah, that, that, that hopefully I'll be going back to do that. Um, mm. when we get out of this business, you know, but who, who knows? Good stuff. And, that is, and there's another, yeah, there's another big thing coming out. Actually, that's the thing I was doing in, in Budapest when I, when I finished The Last Kingdom, I got just incredibly lucky and, and, and that's how I was managed. That's how I managed to, to give the illusion that I was still in The Last Kingdom. I was, I was still in Budapest, but I was doing another job. There you go. <laughs> I was doing another job. And that is, that is a very big job. I, I can't say anything about it, but I, ah. I, I think that might come out next year. Yeah, that will probably come out next year, but it'll be sort of, probably towards the end of next year. So it'll be a long time, um, but there will be a, a big fanfare over that one. I can assure you. We'll be excited for that. Mm -hmm. We're we'll looking forward to that. And one more question before we go, uh, what are your goals as an actor? I love doing, you know, all those sort of militaristic uh, warrior roles, not, not necessarily period roles. I, you know, I've done sort of more modern day military things. Um, I mean, you have to play to your type. I'm, I'm six or four, 17, so about hundred and, 110 kilos. So yeah, that is my casting type, that kind of big guy thing. The thing that I alluded to earlier is, is, you know, it's more of a sensitive thing. I, I, have, a, I have a wife and I, and I have, you know, political relations and it's not just wielding a sword. So it's, it's, it's more subtle. It's more fine brush strokes. Um, so yeah, you know, more of that. As Charlton Heston once said, I understand he was a very big Shakespearean actor uh, and he played a lot of the Shakespearean, you know the great leading Shakespearean roles, and they said, well, "Why have you never played Hamlet?" And he said, "Well, you know, I'm six foot four. I'm I don't know how how much he weighs. I'm two hundred. I'm six four. I'm two hundred and ten pounds. Can you imagine me saying to be or not to be? I would have just I would have just run Polonius through with a in, in the first act, stuck the Philia on my shoulder, and walked off into the sunset. You know, <laughs> really shallying around. You know, that's kind of where I am. You, you, you can't play against. Well, they often don't let you play against type." So, and I'm happy to do that, but every now and again, you, you they let you through, and you and you get an opportunity to do something that's a little bit more subtle, and and hopefully I'm going to embrace those opportunities, and and if they come along, so yeah, awesome. More. Well, awesome, Adrian. We really appreciate you coming on to the Screen Chronicles. If you want to see more of Adrian Boucher, check him out on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Check out his IMDb. You can find yeah, we'll have his IMD B IMDB link down below so you can go click on that. Check him out. Adrian Boucher. Uh, you can check him out on The Last Kingdom on Netflix. Uh, and you can check out more of the Screen Chronicles. We're on podcasts, YouTube, 
Uh, so whatever one you're listening to on, you can check us out on the other one as well. And we're on social media as well. So check us out. But it's been great. Great talk with Adrian Boucher today. Thanks for listening, guys. You Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it and good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Thanks for coming on. Yes. See you guys. Bye.